Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. Here we will take up the news articles from the Hindu Delhi edition and discuss them as per the demands of UPSC Civil Services exam. The topics for today's discussion are listed on your screen. Let us begin our discussion. Before starting the discussion, we have an important announcement regarding the PSIR optional test series for 2023 mains. This test series will include 16 tests which are available both offline and online. and there will be timely evaluation and feedback mechanism for this particular test series moreover the test discussions and doubt solving sessions will be taken up exclusively by rahul puri sir and we will also provide the model answers for the previous year papers of 2021 and 2022 just enroll yourself for this test series to improve your chances for clearing the mains exam with psir optional The first article of today's discussion is based on this news which featured at page number 10 in The Hindu. It basically talks about the issue of potable water in India and the recent study which is conducted by WHO revealed that the piped potable water can avert around 4 lakh diarrhea deaths in India. The topic of drinking water is highly relevant for general studies paper 3 under environment section. and it is also one of the repetitive theme in the upsc mains exam in 2019 upsc asked about national watershed project and similarly in 2020 upsc specifically asked the salient features of jal shakti abhiyan so in that sense it is an important topic for our discussion and the discussion premise includes the study conducted by who present status of water in india the jal jeevan mission and the other measures with respect to drinking water firstly we will look at the present situation in india currently about 62% of the rural households have piped water connections which was around 17% in 2019 and the significant increase attributes to jal jeevan mission atal bhujal yojana and jal shakti abhiyan which government of india has launched to improve the drinking water situation in the country further in rural areas 80 to 90% of the drinking water and 70% of the water which is used in agriculture comes from ground water resources it shows the dependence of rural india on ground water resources the composite water index of 2019 by niti ayog says that 21 major cities including delhi and chennai are on the brink of exhausting water resources and 70% of india's water resources are contaminated Further a report by Central Ground Water Board says that 21 states of India have high arsenic levels than the BIS limits and you can also quote these two examples while writing answer on water and water resources Shimla and Chennai has suffered water crisis in 2018 and 2019 respectively you can use these data points to enrich your answer now we will have a look at the study of who related to the piped water in india piped potable water would avoid 14 million delis which is the disability adjusted life years from diarrhea the delis represents the loss of equivalent of one year of full health and are a way to account for the years of life lost due to premature mortality and the years lived with disability due to prevalent cases of diseases or health condition in a population by ensuring the pipe potable water can save close to 100 billion dollars and 66 million hours every day of time that would be spent by women to collect water and it also says there are five states gujarat telangana goa haryana and punjab which have 100% coverage of pipe water and there is one recommendation in that every dollar which is invested in sanitation interventions gives a 4 dollar return in the form of reduced healthcare costs as it will reduce the burden of diseases on the population now we will go through the measures which are taken by government with respect to drinking water like we have divided the steps in executive and legislative domain you can also do that to give better structure to your answers under legislative steps government of india enacted the water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act in 1974 it aims to provide for the prevention and control of water pollution in india and it also focuses on maintaining or restoration of water bodies 
and the government schemes will come under executive steps the first one here is atal bhujal yojana the goal of atal bhujal yojana is to demonstrate a community led sustainable water management strategy and it also focuses on management of groundwater resources in water stressed areas in identified states and these states include gujarat haryana karnatak madhya pradesh maharashtra rajasthan and uttar pradesh just try to remember these seven states as it can come in prelims exam also and most importantly the state of punjab which is facing a serious issue of groundwater depletion has not been covered under this particular scheme and it can be used in elimination if a question appears on atal bhujal yojana there is a program named jal shakti abhiyan it was launched in 2019 as a water conservation campaign it focuses on water conservation rain harvesting and rejuvenation of water bodies through public participation and community driven initiatives and the third initiative is jal jeevan mission in today's discussion we will try to cover this particular mission in detail and the motivation to discuss jal jeevan mission lies in this year's question as it has directly asked the jal shakti abhiyan and its salient features and it has been 4 years since the jal jeevan mission has been launched so there is a possibility that upsc might directly ask a question on jal jeevan mission in 2019 jal jeevan mission was launched to make the provision of portable tap water supply to every rural household by 2024 and what is the vision of this particular mission every rural household has drinking water supply in adequate quantity of prescribed quality on regular and long term basis which further leads to which further leads to improvement in the living standards of rural communities these are the basic details about jal jeevan mission and there is one more point which needs to be highlighted here water is a state subject and the powers to plan and implement the water supply schemes are vested with states just try to remember this fact as it can be useful for the prelims exam also now we will discuss the components which are under jal jeevan mission the first component is in village water supply infrastructure for tap water connection to every rural household the second one reliable drinking water source development and augmentation of existing sources the third one transfer of water from water surplus areas to water stress areas by convergence of multi village schemes and it also includes technological intervention for the treatment to make water potable especially in those areas where water quality is an issue but quantity is sufficient for example coastal areas the next one retrofitting of completed and ongoing pipe water supply schemes to provide functional household tap connection and raise the level of services and it also includes the provision for grey water management now what is grey water it is a waste water from non toilet plumbing systems such as hand basins washing machines showers and baths and this water can be used for watering plants fields and washing vehicles and lastly there is a provision of capacity building of various stakeholders and support the activities to facilitate the implementation so here we have broadly covered the components of jal jeevan mission which can be used in some or other way in your answers and what are the other steps with respect to drinking water problem the first one here is annual water audits and it is needed to assess the demand and supply in a particular region further national aquifer mapping and management program and the aim of this program is to estimate the health of aquifers and their management further many state governments are working with local bodies to assess the gravity of the situation and to devise a mechanism to resolve the problem for example in delhi underground reservoir cum booster stations has been made at many places to counter the problem of water scarcity and you can also mention this ram ravas kala model of rajasthan which focuses on building water harvesting structures such as nadis talabs to improve the water availability in the regions which are facing the problem of water and in such topics you can also mention a case study of israel which is famous for its water management as more than 90% of the waste water is treated for reuse in israel and there is a company named watergen which has set up the water generators 
to produce water from air. And at the Hockey World Cup of 2023, which was hosted by Odisha, this mechanism was experimented. And it can act as a sustainable solution for water scarce regions and also saves the groundwater. Now, what can be the key steps that can be taken to move forward? The first one is improve water infrastructure. We need to enhance the development and maintenance of water supply and sanitation infrastructure, particularly in rural areas. And this includes the construction of dams, water treatment plants, and the distribution networks to ensure safe and reliable access to clean water for all. Promote water conservation and efficiency. We need to implement measures to reduce the water usage and increase the efficiency in water use. And how it can be done? We need to encourage the adoption of water saving technologies such as drip irrigation, sprinkler irrigation, which will reduce the irrational usage of water, especially in agriculture sector. We need to enhance watershed management. The focus should be on sustainable management of water resources at watershed level. And to do that, we need to implement the measures to prevent soil erosion, promote reforestation, and restore the degraded ecosystems. The next one, strengthen water governance. We need to improve water governance by enhancing coordination among different government agencies which are responsible for water management, such as local government bodies, private agencies, and the bodies under state government, such as JAL boards. There is a need to develop integrated water resource management plans that consider the needs of various sectors, including agriculture, industry, and domestic use. And the next one, ensure water quality and sanitation. We need to address the issue of water pollution and contamination, as highlighted by Niti Aayog, by implementing effective water quality monitoring systems. And there is a need to promote the wastewater treatment technologies to prevent the discharge of untreated effluents into water bodies, such as ponds and rivers. Further, there is a need to promote water-sensitive agriculture. Sustainable agriculture practices that minimize water consumption and reduce the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides should be promoted, such as millets and pulses. We need to provide training and support to farmers to adopt climate-smart agriculture practices. There is a need for cross-sectoral collaboration. We need to foster collaboration between various sectors, including water, agriculture, energy, and environment to address the water problem holistically. And for that, we need to develop integrated policies and strategies that consider the interlinkages between water and other sectors. Also, there is a need to invest in research and innovation. Government should invest in water-related research institutions and encourage the collaboration between academia and industry, like done by Israel. The Watergen company is a startup of Israel which is producing water from air. And finally, there is a need to raise awareness and promote behavioral change. Government should conduct public awareness campaigns such as Jal Shakti Abhyan, to educate people about the importance of water conservation, sanitation, and responsible use. One more thing which can be highlighted here is this particular example. UPSC in 2020 asked this particular question on Jal Shakti Abhyan and it is a public campaign for water conservation and water security. And you can directly use that in your answer as example. It is also a way to use the knowledge of previous year questions in your answers. A quick recap to our discussion. First of all, we have discussed the context with respect to WHO study, its relevance for General Studies Paper 3. We have seen the previous year questions, the present situation of water in India, the facts about WHO study, the measures taken by government with respect to drinking water, and we break that under legislative and executive steps. Further, we discussed in detail about Jal Jeevan Mission, its components, and other steps which have been taken with respect to water, and a case study of Israel, and a roadmap for future. Moving on to the next topic, which featured at page number 6 in The Hindu. It basically talks about the monetary policy's recent unwavering focus on price stability is informed largely by its mandate to achieve the consumer price index inflation target of 4%, which it has struggled to actualize right since January 2021. Monetary policy is an important theme under economy section of General Studies Paper 3. And in 2013, 
a question on FRBM Act was asked directly by UPSC and the inflation has been in news since a long time. So there are chances that a direct question on monetary policy or its role in targeting inflation can be asked this year. So in today's discussion we will try to analyze the different aspects of monetary policy. Further, it is an important topic for UPSC prelims exam also. As you can see, in 2017, a direct question on monetary policy committee was asked. You will be able to answer this particular question after the discussion. Now we will try to see what is monetary policy. Monetary policy is a set of tools used by nation's central bank to control the money supply in the economy and to promote economic growth in the country. And under RBI Act 1934, Reserve Bank of India has been given the responsibility of conducting monetary policy with a primary objective of maintaining the price stability while keeping in mind the objective of growth. And the next is monetary policy framework. In 2016, RBI Act of 1934 was amended to provide a statutory basis for the implementation of flexible inflation targeting framework. And under section 45ZA, the central government in consultation with RBI determines the inflation target in terms of consumer price index once in 5 years. So it is important to note that central government along with RBI determines the inflation target in the terms of consumer price index. Now we will discuss the details about monetary policy committee. Section 45ZB of 2016 amendment of the RBI Act provides for a six member committee to be constituted by center government and it was first constituted in September 2016 and the members of the committee include the governor of RBI who is the chairperson, deputy governor of RBI and one officer of RBI. Apart from these three members, there are other three members who are appointed and nominated by center government. The Monetary Policy Committee determines the policy rate required to achieve the inflation target in the economy and it is required to meet at least four times in a year and there is also a quorum and which is at least four members should be there to conduct the operations of the committee and under Monetary Policy Committee each member has equal vote but the RBI governor has a casting vote that means if there is a tie then governor of RBI has a second vote and the most appropriate way to reduce the impact of inflation is to increase the interest rates in the economy and that is the policy repo rate and recently RBI has increased the policy rate let us try to understand what is the positive and negative impact of that particular move firstly we will discuss the positives of recent RBI rate hikes first of all the headline inflation has eased in March and April, slowing down to 4.7% in the first month of current fiscal years, as compared to the average of 6.7% in the last fiscal year. Secondly, the macroeconomic fundamentals have also strengthened after the unrelenting focus on preserving price and financial stability. Now we'll discuss what is the negative impact of recent rate hikes. Firstly, there is an increase in credit cost. It is an obvious impact as the interest rates will be increasing the credit cost at which the loans will be provided will be high. So it will reduce the investments and consumptions in the economy. Secondly, the bank credit data show the pace of growth in loans to industry particularly MSME and medium sectors slowed appreciably last year. Further, there is a contraction in the private consumption due to the high borrowing cost. Here we have discussed the positive and negative impact of RBI rate hikes in Indian economy. Now what are the risks to inflation projections in India? Firstly, the spatial and temporal distribution of rainfall during the wake of El Nino conditions. It directly impacts the agriculture sector and if the production is low, obviously the prices will increase and will lead to inflation in the economy. Further, the geopolitical tensions such as Russian-Ukraine war as it has increased the cost of products which are imported by India from these countries. Further, there is a uncertainty over international commodity prices 
which includes sugar, rice and crude oil. And lastly, there is a volatility in global financial markets which can be attributed to the failure of banks in United States of America. As the world is more globalized and interconnected today, which means if an event is happening in any part of the world, it will impact the economic ecosystem of the world countries. Hence, in this particular scenario, the role of monetary policy in Indian economy is very crucial and desirable to maintain the price stability and to contain inflation. A quick recap to our discussion. Firstly, we discussed the context, its relevance for General Studies Paper 3. We have seen one previous year mains question and a prelims question of 2017. We discussed about monetary policy and monetary policy framework. And after that, monetary policy committee, the positives and negatives of recent rate hikes and the risks to inflation projections in India. Now we will discuss one case study from General Studies Paper 4. And this case has appeared in UPSC mains exam of 2020. The context is that the chairman of Bharat Missile Limited, which is BML, was watching a program on TV where Prime Minister was addressing the nation on the necessity of developing a self-reliant India. BML had admirably progressed from producing first-generation anti-tank guided missiles to designing and producing the state-of-art the ATGM weapon systems. The chairman of BML was also of the view that government would probably not alter the status quo of a ban on export of military weaponry. To his surprise, he got a phone call from Director General of Ministry of Defense asking him to discuss the modalities of increasing BML production of ATGMs as there is a possibility of exporting the same to a friendly foreign country. And two days later, Defence Minister stated that he aims to double the current weapons export level within five years. And this will help in financing and manufacturing of indigenous weapons in the country. He also stated that all indigenous arms factoring nations have a very good record of international arms trade. And the question says, as the chairman of BML, what are your views on the following points? The first one is, as an arms exporter of responsible nation like India, what are the ethical issues involved in arms trade? The second point, list 5 ethical factors that would influence the decisions to sell arms to foreign governments. You need to answer this case study in 250 words. Before solving that, let us try to have a look at this framework. You need to introduce the case by highlighting its core issues such as arms trade, peace and security, etc. Then in body, write down 4-5 to five ethical issues which are involved in the case and list 5 ethical factors that would influence the decisions to sell arms to foreign governments. And to conclude your answer, write a generalized conclusion to deal with such problems at national and global level. By following this kind of framework, you will be able to address each and every part of the question. Now we will discuss the ethical issues involved in the case. The first one is human rights violation. If the foreign government has a history of human rights violation, then selling arms to them would be unethical for India. Second one is destabilization of the region. If a foreign government use the weapons for vested interests, then it can destabilize the region and which will also impact the security scenario of India. Thirdly, the risks of arms falling into wrong hands. If the arms of weapons falls into wrong hands, then it can lead to atrocities for general public which will create chaos and havoc in that particular country. Further, there is also a risk of arms being used against India. As we cannot be assured that the weapons will not be used against India and if that happens, it will create a major problem for the national security to our country. And lastly, there is a risk of arms being used for terrorist activities. There are also chances that such weapons and arms can be used by terrorists if they get a hold on those weapons and it can lead to the killings of innocent people who are living in that particular country or a country which shares border with that particular country. Here we have discussed 5 ethical issues which are involved in this particular case. Now we will try to analyze the ethical factors that would affect the decision of arms trade. Firstly, 
फ्रेंडली रिलेशन विद कंसर्न कंट्री मैनी टाइम्स अ फ्रेंडशिप विद अ कंट्री मे इन्फ्लुएंस आर्म स्टेट एट ग्लोबल फॉरम फॉर एग्जाम्पल रशिया हैज गुड रिलेशन विद इंडिया एंड चाइना एंड देर आर लेस चांसेस दैट रशिया विल डिनाई एक्सपोर्टिंग आर्म्स टू इंडिया और चाइना द सेकेंड इज स्टेबिलिटी ऑफ द रीजन एज आर्म ट्रेड्स कैन प्रोवाइड एन ऑपरचुनिटी टू डी स्टेबिलाईज और डिस्टर्ब द ऑर्डर ऑफ पीस इन द रीजन इट इज इम्पॉर्टेंट टू कीप दिस पर्टिकुलर फैक्ट इन माइंड वेल ट्रेडिंग इन आर्म्स थर्डली ग्लोबल पीस पीस एंड सिक्योरिटी आर वन ऑफ द ग्रेटेस्ट फैक्टर्स अफेक्टिंग आर्म्स ट्रेड बिकॉज रियलिज्म फोकसेज ऑन अटेनमेंट ऑफ पावर फॉर सेल्फ प्रिजर्वेशन द फोर्थ वन सोशल कॉन्ट्रैक्ट द स्टेट इज लीगली ऑब्लाइज टू प्रोवाइड सेफ्टी एंड सिक्योरिटी फॉर इट्स सब्जेक्ट सच एज सिटीजन्स एंड इन ऑर्डर टू डू दैट गवर्नमेंट मे नीड टू स्ट्रेंथन एंड मॉडर्नाइज द आर्मी बाय बाइंग न्यू आर्म्स द नेक्स्ट वन इज यूटिलिटेरियनिज्म एज वी ऑल नो The corporate world works on the basis of profit, and the MNCs involved in manufacturing of arms tries to maximize the arms trade at global level through any means. Further, self-determination. As we all know, there are insurgent groups in almost all countries which try to secure self-determination and to achieve independence. They need arms to fight against the state. And lastly, justice. many a times global community think that of authoritarian type of government that involved in injustice to a particular community and in that sense it is the moral obligation of global community to ensure justice and to do so they may need to fight with local government and this fight will directly affect arms trade and the classic example to this point is the middle east and russia ukraine war many western countries like united states have been providing arms to the people of these regions so that they can fight for their lives thus it can be said that exportation thus it can be said that the export of arms can bring prosperity to indigenous arm industry but it may also pose a challenge to the regional peace and security so in this way you can conclude your answer to this particular case study Moving on to the next topic which is based on this news which featured at page number 4 in the Hindu. It basically talks about the controversy which is revolving around the Mekedatu dam and the issue is unlikely to be discussed at the upcoming meeting of Kaveri Water Management Authority as Tamil Nadu officials refer to a previous decision to await Supreme Court's ruling. This topic is important for prelims exam as UPSC previously asked questions related to rivers and their characteristics as you can see in 2016 upsc asked that in which of the following regions shale gas resources are found kambe basin kaveri basin krishna godavari basin and out of these three options you need to identify the correct one and similarly in 2019 upsc asked about famous places and the rivers which are associated with them and in this question you need to identify which of the pairs given above are correctly matched This was the traditional way of asking questions related to rivers by UPSC but in 2023 UPSC has gone one step forward in this particular regard as you can see in this question the first statement says Jhelum river passes through Vullar lake second statement says Krishna river directly feeds Kolleru lake and the third statement says meandering of Gandak river formed Kaver lake and in this question you need to identify how many of the statements given above are correct so in this question upsc is not asking the basic information it is going one step ahead to test the knowledge of candidates today we will try to analyze the different aspects and facts about kaveri river of india it rises at the brahmagiri range in western ghats in kodagu district of the state of karnataka we have three facts here the first one is brahmagiri range the second is western ghats and the state from where it rises is karnataka just try to remember these facts as it can be helpful for you in your prelims exam the second fact is it is the third largest river after godavari and krishna in southern india you need to pay attention to this fact as it is talking about southern india and not the whole of india and the largest river in the state of tamil nadu here again we found two facts 
द फर्स्ट वन इज इट इज द थर्ड लार्जेस्ट रिवर इन सदर्न इंडिया एंड द लार्जेस्ट रिवर ऑफ स्टेट ऑफ तमिलनाडु नाउ द लेफ्ट बैंक ट्रिब्यूटरीज ऑफ कावेरी रिवर देर आर फोर ऑफ दैम हरंगी हेमावती शिमशा एंड अर्कावती एंड द राइट बैंक ट्रिब्यूटरीज इंक्लूड लक्ष्मण तीरथ काबिनी स्वर्णवती भावीनी नोएल एंड अमरावती एज इट इज डिफिकल्ट टू रिमेंबर द लेफ्ट एंड राइट बैंक ट्रिब्यूटरीज बट द ओनली थिंग विच इज रिक्वायर्ड फॉर प्रिलियम्स एग्जाम इज द आइडेंटिफिकेशन ऑफ राइट ऑप्शन इफ यू हैव अ रफ आइडिया अबाउट दीज ट्रिब्यूटरीज यू विल बी एबल टू मार्क अ करेक्ट आंसर इफ अ क्वेश्चन अपियर्स ऑन दीज लाइन फर्दर द रिवर ब्रेक्स इन टू लार्ज नंबर ऑफ डिस ट्रिब्यूटरीज इन तमिलनाडु बिफोर एम्पटिंग इन टू बे ऑफ बेंगाल and it forms a delta which is known as garden of southern india so here we found an important fact related to kaveri river as it forms a wide delta which is known as garden of southern india and lastly the river basin covers three states and a union territory such kind of facts and information are asked by upsc in prelims exam before so you should be aware about these kind of facts the three states include tamil nadu karnataka and kerala and the union territory is puducherry in this slide we have discussed multiple facts which are related to kaveri river one more important information which we want to share regarding this river is that in ancient tamil literature this river is called poni now we will discuss about mekedattu project which is a point of contention the project will actually come up at at onti gondu which is about 1.5 kilometers from what is known as meke datu and this reservoir will be formed at the confluence of kaveri and arkavathi rivers try to remember this piece of information that meke datu project will come up at the confluence of kaveri and arkavathi river and the aim of the project is to supply the drinking water to bengaluru and the surrounding areas and will also generate the 400 megawatts of hydroelectric power and to achieve these goals karnataka wants to construct a concrete gravity dam at meke datu with a storage capacity of 67000 million cubic feet and as we all know tamil nadu is opposing this particular project due to a fear that karnataka will hold water in this dam and they also contested that as per the interstate river water disputes act Karnatak cannot build a dam without the consent of lower riparian state which is Tamil Nadu in this particular case that was all about the Meke Datu project and the controversy related to that now we will solve these three questions which were asked in UPSC prelims exam in this particular question we need to find the regions in which the shale gas resources are found and in this question all the options are correct and the answer to this question becomes D which is 1 2 and 3 and to this particular question only the pair 3 is incorrectly matched as hampi is located at the banks of tungbhadra river and not at malprabha river so the moment you eliminate 3 you will reach the correct answer which is a now from this question you will be getting an idea how the key facts associated with particular rivers are important to eliminate the options in prelims exam and for this question the statement 1 is correct as jhelum river passes through vullar lake The second statement says Krishna River directly feeds Kolleru Lake. It is an incorrect statement as there are two seasonal streams, Budmeru and Tamleru, which directly feeds the Kolleru Lake, which makes the statement two incorrect. And the third statement is also incorrect as Kaval Lake is not formed due to the meandering of Gandak River. So in this question only statement one is correct and the answer to this question becomes A, which is one only. That's all for today's discussion. Thank you for watching today's DNS. Stay tuned for upcoming sessions which will enhance your preparation for the UPSC Civil Services exam.